wanted to continue with the energy team and where the previous two excellent speakers have, have left up. Quite a lot we have been talking about sustainability. So I wanted to, in my speech, to develop a bit more into the role of energy in sustainability as well as sustainability of energy. So going more into the global concepts of sustainability. In terms of the definitions, you all know the definition of sustainable development is a development that meets the needs of the future, but without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And uh, this definition, as you can see, it's, it's pretty much put into the center human needs. And quite a lot during today, the theme has been indeed humans and human interactions. There are some critiques also towards this definition because it does not seem to set any limits to economic growth. And indeed, the environmental issue seems to be a bit implicit. So if we are able to meet today's need without jeopardizing future uh, generations, that seems to indicate that we have managed to satisfy our needs within planetary limits. However, as I mentioned, this is more implicit and it's more considered as a process of change, where resources use technological developments and institutional change are in balance. So I've been pondering if this is the development, so what is the end? What is the end of sustainable development? When do we actually reach sustainability and what would that be? My proposal would be this balance picture, where on the right side we have human needs, starting on the bottom with basic physiological needs for food and shelter and water, Next, with safety needs for shelter, infrastructure, clothing and other types of goods, followed by kind of psychological needs for self-fulfillment, for education, for jobs. And on the top, kind of larger societal needs in terms of justice, equality, all we would like to live in a world, a peaceful world, where justice and equality prevails. So if that is one end, then this equilibrium state would indicate that the same kind of needs of ecosystems are also met. And ecosystems have a bit fewer needs, but similarly to us, they have a need for fuel, which in their case is sun and water. They're not competing with sun, but in some cases competing for water. And in the next level, it's habitat. It's very important that ecosystems have their habitat to expand and live in. And this is where quite often the problem happens that we encroach in the habitat of ecosystems and disturbing biodiversity. And finally, diversity is an important issue for the ecosystems because we have seen that ecosystems where inter- and intraspecies diversity is higher are more resilient. So... This is what would be an ideal balance that we, all of the humans would meet their needs, but at the same time, ecosystem needs are met as well. Of course, by many, this is considered an unattainable, uh, unattainable issue, and especially considering limitations uh, of, un, uh, I mean, the consideration of unlimited growth in a limited system. We have already seen today a couple of times the reference to the sustainable development goals, which have been ac accepted by the United Nations Assembly setting forward the 17 goals in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which is called a shared blueprint and a call for action for all of the countries. In these goals, quite many here are as well human-related goals, so satisfying human needs, no poverty, zero hunger, health, education, gender equality, access to water and energy. Some economic concepts in terms of decent growth, infrastructure and reduce equalities. And a very few only, actually, technically, there's only three, which is particularly considering ecosystems or impact on ecosystems. But the numbers make a difference as well. Of course, the number one priority is, is elevating poverty and, and eradicate entirely extreme poverty, which is unfortunately still prevalent. I want to particularly talk about SDG 7, which is the goal for clean and affordable energy and what is the global status at the moment. It's a three key goals, and the number one is universal access to modern sources of energy, and this modern sources of energy, energy services, is a key issue. We are talking about electricity, particularly, but also clean cooking fuels, for example. 
Number two is about energy percentage of renewable energy. And number three is energy efficiency. So I highlighted a little bit that this is in this team important issue. So energy efficiency in particular, reducing the energy intensity of our goods and, and services. But there are also these horizontal objectives, which one of them is international collaboration, sharing research results and results of innovations towards sustainable energy. And the B objective on the other end is finances. The more developed countries have together pledged to put forward finances for a just transition fund from where the less developed and low-income countries can tap in into realizing their own renewable energy infrastructure expansion. Now, I have to mention here there is the massive disparity in terms of access to modern sustainable energy. At the moment, an estimated 700 million people who have no access to electricity, not even basic tier one. Tier one access would be just four hours of access, for example, if you have some small solar panel and batteries. Many of those also who have access, it could be a low tier. So indeed, there is no 24 hour access to electricity, which would be only at tier four and five. But even worse is the statistics, the access to clean fuels. About 2.4 billion people are still using open fire and all sorts of biomass to cook their food or to heat their homes, which is a health risk as well, because these small particulates in un inefficient burners are creating the health risk into the houses. So these are the challenges we are facing, and it's was striking to me considering that we are talking on a subject of 6G and really extreme high level of development in, in a world where we have really regions with no access even to basic energy services. So I just wanted to keep it in mind and put it in context. Now, in, the, in this context, that what is the role of energy for sustainability? So if we return this balance picture, so on the right side, we have all of those sustainability goals and needs, in particular for humans. So basic human needs are physiological needs on the bottom, food and healthcare and water, then safety needs for shelter, it's housing and sustainable consumption infrastructure. Then a higher level need is for jobs and education and equality. And finally, what I would call a societal needs, as I mentioned, you would like to all live in a world where peace and prosperity, justice and equality prevails. So all of this, all of this, of course, require energy because all of these systems and all of these industry sectors, all of these services need energy to run. And now this is the challenge to maintain the other end of the balance, the environmental goals, which are in particular keeping low emissions. So we have a low low level of, of CO2 in the energy generated, non-polluting, especially the pollution of seas is a serious problem, and preserving biodiversity, as I already mentioned. So it is a massive challenge if you consider in the, in the world where we have almost half of the population doesn't necessarily have access to safe and healthy energy sources, and we have millions who have no access to energy whatsoever. So this is a massive challenge ahead, uh, ahead of us to consider. So from this point of view, if I would define sustainable energy, say my official definition would be an energy that meets the needs of current generation without compromising the need of future generations. And in, in usually we have these three aspects, the environmental, social and economic aspects within sustainability. So in this point, the environmental aspects is carbon neutral and non-polluting. It also leaves space for ecosystems, as I mentioned, keeps within planetary boundaries. And a social issue is within this intra and intergenerational equity, fair share of benefits and no burden shifting could be acceptable. And indeed, as mentioned, accessible and affordable energy to all. And we, of course, should not forget the economic part of it. Investments, of course, have to pay themselves back. But it also involves that this massive infrastructure that we are deploying, it has to be optimized and utilized optimally, which, as the distinguished speakers before me have mentioned, digital solutions will have a massive role in that. 
But I feel that it would be important to have, in addition to this three, this fourth kind of global <laughs> component as well, in terms that we should have such strategies in sustainable energy that address this equitable development, that we don't have this massive disparity between the global north and the global south operating within a fair share of resources. Because as a reminder, sustainability as a concept is an absolute, which means it's indivisible. You cannot be almost sustainable. If we are sustainable, it means everybody everywhere is sustainable. So I think it's relevant to consider this issue as well. Professor Lund already showed this figure to you that we have entered the quadrant phase in terms of the climate change and our window of opportunity is closing fast. Even with the current policies, we are heading to a plus three degrees increase, even with the pledges. What countries have pledged, not necessarily have yet done, but pledged even that leads to a more than a two degrees increase. Currently, last year was 1.11 degrees hotter than the average in the 19th century in the last nine years was the nine hottest years on the record. So this is a massive challenge. But I wanted to add to this as well that the cost element, which I mentioned before, so how much does it cost to combat climate change and have low carbon solutions? This is what we call this abatement curve. And you can see the horizontal line is the zero line. So what is below the line, it means that Basically, those solutions save money. So, of course, these businesses use the solutions, which you could see on the right side, that we keep the same types of power plants, but sequester carbon. They are extremely expensive. But our main important solution lies in particularly these building energy efficiency solutions, which are at the far left of this curve. This is, what I would call, a low-hanging fruit, because there is massive energy consumption in buildings and indeed in very low cost solutions which pay themselves back as I mentioned they save money that's the most economic means to mitigate climate change so the subjects what we are dealing with in the research what we are dealing with is globally relevant and can have a very important significance and also looking at that how much from this business as usual these solutions can actually reduce CO2 going to the atmosphere, again, energy efficiency is top mentioned, even with the low-cost solution. So indeed, again, it's a low-hanging fruit. But notice that it's mentioned also behavior changes. So behavior, human behaviors, and how humans act, what is their personal choices, what is their awareness level, and how their awareness reflects in their consumption choices is very important. So. Consumption and consumption habits is a very relevant issue for us to consider because efficiency gains are very easily offset by higher level of consumption. So this is what we need to incorporate, that these habits, these energy efficient habits, they are lasting and they are not going to be replicated to the degree that all the efficiency gains are in a sense offset. In relation to consumption, I also wanted to introduce you this concept of planetary overshoot. The planetary overshoot has been measured and followed up already from the 70s, and it basically means that to what degree and when have we consumed this year's share of resources. So it's calculated considering the planet's biocapacity, how much resources the planet can provide, and the ecological footprint of the population. So as you can see, this the green line is going down. And at the moment, last year, we have used up our entire years of resources by July 28. You can notice a tiny dip back up in 2020. That was the importance and the relevance of pandemic, the 2020 lockdowns. But and we have reduced CO2 emissions 6%, but we bounced back immediately the next year. So this is where we are at now. We are living on a deficit. We have been living on a deficit for more than 50 years. We consume more what we have, and population is growing. Another number to add in emerging economies, 
an estimated 1.5 billion new middle class consumers are going to enter the economy. And they also want the same well-being as we have. They also want the opportunity to say level of consumption. So there is more people who want to share this amount of well-being. So the only solution to this equation is that indeed our consumption habits have to be more sustainable and more realistic. So this spurred this moment of move the day movement, push the day backward. And there are two key measures that have been recognized to this effect. Number one is reducing the carbon component because 60% of humanity's ecological footprint is carbon based because of the carbon emissions. That would have the impact of pushing back the date with three months. But it's important to notice that already existing, so off the shelf existing solutions to energy efficiency for both buildings, industry, transportation, that could push back 20 days. So here is our opportunity as well to push back a lot more this date with these very advanced solutions, which as it has been presented before, there is massive opportunities ahead. But that's very important that we try to reduce and in particularly go to the consumption part to the households and offer such solutions where humans can live sustainable. We give the opportunity for humans to live sustainably. We give the tools, the technologies and the services that will contribute to a more sustainable lifestyle. So from this point of view, what are the opportunities and how to ensure energy efficiency and I would add and the sustainability of digitally enhanced human user-centric systems? Well, originally I suppose the idea is that the digitally enabled systems prioritize the needs and preferences of users. But I think we should add to it that not just prioritize the needs of users, but also facilitate sustainable behavior and in an equitable matter. I want to return to this equitability a bit later. So, for example, I'm speaking on behalf of energy systems, what we have heard many excellent speeches already mentioning how the energy efficiency of the systems need to be improved components as well, in particularly. But I need to also mention that many of these components that are needed or are used looks to me that they are very short lifetime. So when we are deploying such infrastructure, it's important to notice what is the lifetime and what's going to happen after the end of the lifetime. What sort of replacement we need? Is it opportunities for upgrade or reuse? So consider the circular design concepts also in the component, not just energy. What is the energy efficiency service the component provides? But what is the sustainability of the component itself. We already do excellent research about energy use optimization in data centers. We have heard solutions, for example, edge computing and also different cooling systems, which have been some innovation done. Power system optimization, of course, is a must, as Professor Lund has explained, and utilizing renewable energy. And also the solutions that these systems can provide for flexibility. So, uh, as I agree, that data and Opportunities for flexibility are going to have the highest value in the future when our energy system is going to be based passively on variable and weather-based systems. So that is an important element. And as I mentioned, I would like to add that these devices facilitate sustainable human behavior and also provide equitability and access. Now, this equitability and access is one of those global considerations. And Early in the morning, Professor Latvaho did mention that there has been a consideration in terms of 6G, how can it serve also emerging economies or developing countries. I think energy efficiency and digitalization per se has many such elements and benefits, which has a common interest and common needs both in the global north and the global south. In the high income countries, we are characterized by high level consumption as we have seen the consequences. So we need to improve the efficiency because of that. Whilst in the developing country or the emerging economy context, firstly, we need to provide the infrastructure and the connectivity first. 
and also since they are in their upward trajectory yet in providing well-being to all of their citizens, they have this tendency of having massive growth of energy need all the time, especially electricity demand, especially in the residential sector. And unfortunately, the systems are not well developed. They are high losses. They are also the same disparities as here as well in terms of their dense urban population, in particularly very dispersed rural population. So these aspects provide both challenges, but also opportunities as well, because I would see that energy efficiency is a common interest in both of the countries. And if possible, there could be maybe some solutions, some experiments or some pilots that can be shared across from north to south, from south to north. Digitalization, I think, is going to play an important role in emerging economies to provide the connectivity and provide this well-being opportunity for the citizens of, of the developing countries because the promise is that they are going to be energy efficient, cost efficient, easy, fast. So, of course, it could definitely serve the needs of highly populated countries which are still under development trajectory. Uh, in particular, in my field in electrification, there's massive opportunities in rural electrification because, as I mentioned, the infrastructure is not working or not existing. In our case, we have more like this top-down sort of development. We have considerations, for example, how the addition of massive amounts of renewables is going to impact the existing energy system while there, since the system does not exist, it can be built up from the bottom up. So we have some small scale local solutions, which then later up could be connected in regional solutions. And when and where these national grids are going to exist then later. So you could have this interesting top down and bottom up approaches at the same time. Smart grids in particular, which is my the research subject of my group, there are massive opportunities to provide well-being to emerging economies in particular. So I would see this role to enable more efficient operations and improved energy efficiency, which could be a shared interest. And of course, help the economic growth and the down impression of costing countries, which are already struggling to provide well-being basic needs for their, for their citizens. And with collaboration, we can speed up this development and contribute to this concept and ideal of global sustainability. And this is one of the sustainable development goals to accelerate international collaboration and access to research and development in the high income countries. And this increased collaboration can support that. Of course, it doesn't necessarily have to be entirely altruistic with such collaboration, we could help and provide new business opportunities, new job creation across the world. But to a large degree, we also have to recognize that this inequality has resulted in, again, also unequal access to resources, which is why I put this subject of full sustainability in this figure. You can see the progress towards the sustainable development goals, so the green ones, the goals where SDGs are achieved and we are on track and the yellows and oranges which are where the challenges remain and uh, the red one where there is still a lot of challenges. You can see in the top portal or the top half there is more by regions and in the bottom it's about low income and high income and I put Finland in particular in the bottom which in 2022 topped the SDG index. So Finland is the most sustainable country, followed by Denmark, Sweden and Norway. The same countries are also the happiest countries according to other objectives. So that's great and, and we are happy and I'm also very proud of that. But of course that means there are still some challenges remaining. The challenges are in particularly in those indicators which are consumption-based indicators. So sustainable consumption emissions and related environmental issues. That's one issue. And the second is international spillover, which means that even though we also see that in Europe, European Union countries are also top 10 or top eight most sustainable countries, but on what expense has it been done? Research indicates when we look at international value chains that 
the values, the benefits and the burdens have not been shared equally. So in Europe, we have the higher value creation, but on the top, on the kind of upstream in the supply chain are the more environmental impacts. So to some degree, we can say that we have externalized the environmental impacts and maybe even could put there that some foreign environmental problems are the sacrifice that has been made for us to be sustainable. And this is, again, I want to return to this issue of sustainability being an absolute. We cannot be sustainable as an island of sustainability in a sea of unsustainability, because that is nonsensical, that doesn't exist. So, as you can see, it's nice that we have reached it, and of course it's an indication that the European model of social democracies is working, and we do manage to perform quite well in terms of economic, social and environmental issues. The only thing missing is this global component that we understand our global impact and perhaps also try to impact ourselves positively to global sustainability. So, in conclusion, this would be my thesis, sort of that how to ensure global relevance of research and contribute to real sustainability. Remembering that energy efficiency is a means, it's not an end, it's a means how we achieve sustainability. And user-centric digitalization have to consider also social justice and global sustainability should be the context within which resource to be made. Consideration, for example, on replaceability, critical material use and geopolitical issues. And it can be done if these sustainability considerations are done already in the research phase. So we proactively try to maximize the socioeconomic benefits while reduce the environmental and social impacts. From this point of view, I think it's also important to consider this global sustainability, always asking that what can we do to enhance sustainability in the global context, because European sustainability should not be achieved on the expense of other countries. So we should always aim at a just transition to an equitable future. And for example, finding these potential solutions between the top-down and bottom-up approaches, shared interests between high-income and developing countries. And my final word is 6G, enhanced uh, sustainable society, basically means that we are using our limited mental resources, our creativity and ingenuity, rather than limited natural resources. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eva. Are we having questions? Anybody? Something on your mind? Crystal clear? Thank you, Eva, for your excellent talk. I was just wondering that because based on this energy crisis worldwide, so attitudes and habits of our customers, their daily life has really changed. And related to your research group and your project, do you currently have some project where you are evaluating those, uh, those changes in, in customers and their everyday life habits? Yes. Do I start with the positive or the negative? <laughs> of course, <laughs> the positive is that, yes, change has indeed happened. We have definitely have seen the reduced consumption, energy consumption, for example. And even though everybody was panicking that they might be power cuts, it didn't, it didn't happen. Our power system was stable. Of course, we were lucky to have a very windy and mild winter as well. However, the bit of a frustration is that these issues that you should save energy you should be mindful. We have been telling that for decades, but only when it actually hurts your purse is when people are actually considering. So, Unfortunately, that's a good incentive. Yes, it is. It is. But I would also like to believe that people may lack awareness what is the global consequences of their actions. And also, we have been discussing a lot in our, in our group and other researchers as well that we should not, of course, place the responsibility for climate change mitigation on the individuals. It should be made easy. And that's exactly why this, this enhanced solutions can help. It should make being sustainable easy, but 
then indeed that should be one of the KPIs, one of the important important kind of objectives that this solution should make, should facilitate sustainable behavior and save money, <laughs> save the environment and money at the same time. Yes. What do you think about incentivizing people to save energy in a similar fashion as they are trying to cut down society level the smoking by introducing bad pictures? <laughs> you turn on your oven, you, you, you get really terrible blinking in your... <laughs> well, actually very close to that indeed, yes, that would be my dream, that we would be having some sort of displays, interactive displays in homes where AI could communicate with you saying that, are you sure you need to switch on your sauna? Are you sure? Could you delay it maybe a couple of hours? It would have this, as Professor Lund mentioned, these predictive functions that it is going to be better in two hours if you could, please, can you delay because it's going to save the environment and money for you. So yes, definitely, yeah. that's exactly what we could do. Good. Are there more questions? There is one here and then one with me. Just a small comment that the behavior is so important that we will teach the next generation, so the children, how they will use their everyday habits. I think quite often children are the ones who bring these, these kind of values home. It, it quite often happened in the, in the fast. And unfortunately, I'm a little bit skeptical about if awareness immediately leads to sustainable action. I think it happens through habits. If we make these habits through routines, if we make these routines, the sustainable behavior easy and effortless, I think that's the way how we could have people collaborate. Thank you, Eva, for inspiring presentation. Actually, for me, the point that you raised about that we have not a sustainable island and we are connected to each other. My question is about that, for example, we are from a research institute. How we can think about providing sustainability for developing or less developed countries that you presented, I think, a very strange statistic about the number of people that don't have access to electricity even for one minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the, million. Yeah, Seven it, it, it was very huge for me and also 2.4 billion, billion people use woods for making cooks and yeah. it was very strange but for the research institute what's your suggestion that for example for me if I'm interested in working on like this but I want to be at on advanced high technology to get funds from the funding agencies do you have any suggestion that research institute can work on those maybe hide aspect of sustainability well, I think exactly this current is just transition funds are supposed to do that and I think and this is a good opportunity but I feel your pain because these are not media sexy subjects <laughs> Funding is easier to get for subjects which are media sexy and then, you know, providing toilets and, and clean cookers are not necessarily such a high impact research which funders come. But I have good hopes for these just transition funds that this is exactly and a lot of lot of money is put and Europe has made a lot of commitments also indeed to have this north south collaboration research. So find a way, make the way, always, always try and, you know, try to consider. We have, we have a very international community, so I think diversity is very important. That's the best that universities can do, that have this diversity of researchers which bring different aspects into considerations that ourselves among us would not be able to make because we don't come from the same, same starting point. Mm -hmm.